Hey everyone, in honor of Halloween just coming up in a few days, I decided in this video to break down Ice Cream Man Volume 5, returning to my Ice Cream Man coverage. Now I've already covered Volumes 1 through 4 here on my channel, so check out those videos if you are interested. Now Ice Cream Man is a, a very weird, disturbing, creepy book. Sometimes when I read certain issues, I'm like, yeah, that was really intriguing and interesting and creepy, but sometimes it's just weird and disturbing and I don't really like it. But <laughs> Ice Cream Man is always kind of interesting in an avant-garde way. And I wanted to uh, dive into it a little bit more in honor of Halloween because I really felt it would uh, fit that time of the year. Now, for those of you that really like Ice Cream Man, well, here we go, let's do it. And for those of you that hate Ice Cream Man, I will be back with a different book next week. But for now, Let's revisit that creepy-ass world and see what other weird stories Ice Cream Man will take us to. So here we go, Ice Cream Man Volume 5, Other Confections. Ice Cream Man Volume 5, Other Confections. Written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morazzo, and colors by Chris O'Halloran. Issue 17, Cape Fear. The cover of this issue is a parody of Action Comics number one, which was the very first appearance of Superman. This entire issue is a disturbing and weird parody of Superman. We meet a woman named Parker Page, who is the analog of Lois Lane from Superman comics. We see a glimpse of Parker Page and her upbringing, first born to a military family, then growing up in the suburbs, then attending journalism school. And this woman, Parker Page, has now become a reporter for the local Urbanopolis newspaper. We see that a story has made the front page of the paper, a story about a flying superhero character that is fighting a man in black. These characters are none other than the Ice Cream Man, who is the superhero in white, and he is fighting Caleb, the man in black. The eternal struggle between the Ice Cream Man, aka Rick Sweet, aka Ricardus, and Caleb, the man in black, continues. Caleb in this issue is known by an alter ego of Cal Cantor. More on him later. In the newspaper offices of the Daily World, the editor in chief is holding up the paper and talking to two of his reporters, Parker Page and another reporter named Timmy. Timmy is a clear parody of Jimmy Olsen from Superman Comics. The newspaper editor is talking about how this ice cream man just arrested Cal Cantor. Parker Page says she's not interested in this headline story just published by her office. She's more concerned by important matters in the world making news. What about her piece on the Syrian government war crimes? Timmy backs Parker Page up, saying, They're using sarin gas on kids, Chief. The editor-in-chief isn't having any of this, and he tells them both, War crimes don't sell papers, Page. People want hope for a better tomorrow. Take a cue from Rick Sweet and write about our big white hero in the sky. Strolling into the room ever confident is Rick Sweet, who is also a reporter here. He is our Clark Kent Superman analog in this world. Rick Sweet is also the hero known as Ice Cream Man that is saving people in Urbanopolis. Overhearing this all, Rick Sweet chimes in. Someone say my name? Sorry I'm late, Chief. I got caught up at the gym. Timmy tells Rick, looking buff, Rick. Parker tells Rick, seems awful coincidental that every time Ice Cream Man saves Urbanopolis, you're working out. Rick Sweet sarcastically replies, What can I say, Parker? This unassuming country lummox loves to stay in shape. After some small office talk, their boss tells them all, Enough chitter-chatter, all of you. We've got papers to sell. Go cover our city's great savior. Later that night, Parker is in deep thought about who this so-called superhero ice cream man actually is. She's somewhat cynical and unconvinced about him, and we hear her narrating as she is typing. 
They call Ice Cream Man our savior, like Jesus of Nazareth, except he wears pajamas and a cape. Big White, the man of titanium, McCreamy. There's no shortage of cute little monikers. Whatever you want to call him, the truth is the same. Ice Cream Man showed up three years ago out of absolutely nowhere like a magic trick. Poof, and he's there in the sky, just in time to save Urbanopolis from Lunarcy the Mad Moon. And so our white clad messiah did go on to perform a multitude of ineffable miracles, each one more Herculean than the last. He conquered a race of cat-eating werewolves from the forests of St. Generous City, fought a backwards version of himself named Strangeo. He even started a whole team of cheery absurd superpersons, each one dressed more garishly than the last. But I'd like to posit that the idea of Ice Cream Man is a bad one. Something is very wrong in Urbanopolis. Parker is then interrupted by her colleague Timmy, who calls her over to have a look out the window. Outside of their window, helicopters are capturing footage of a mechanical giant spider that is attacking their city. Luckily though, none other than Ice Cream Man swiftly arrives and saves the city from this spider. Parker's unbelieving narration continues. One man to save us all. It's a nice sentiment, but that math has never added up. As the Ice Cream Man saves the day yet again and hurls the giant mechanical spider off to the sun, Parker has had just about enough. She rambles back to her desk, stating that she has real work to finish. As she heads back, a voice then says to her, He's not what everyone thinks he is. Parker then sees sitting at her desk the man we know as Caleb, the man in black, also known as Rick's cousin and alter ego that tries to correct all the wrong that he does. But in this issue, he is the man that Ice Cream Man has fought within the newspaper headline earlier. In this story, Caleb is presented to Urbanopolis as a man named Cal Cantor. Cal Cantor is a parody of the Superman villain Lex Luthor. Parker, suddenly seeing Cal sitting at her desk, says to him, Cal Cantor? You're supposed to be in jail. Cal Cantor then shares a strange message with Parker. He says, You can't imprison a feeling. This world isn't your own, Miss Page. It's a farce, one of his play places. He's grafted a child's mythology onto the skin of your reality. One man to save us all? You know better than that. Salvation's on all of us, Parker. We're all connected. Everything is one thing. Cal is referring to the Ice Cream Man when he says all of this, and how the Ice Cream Man can seemingly manipulate people's reality. Parker, ignoring this jabbering, says to Cal, I'm calling the cops. Save it for the feds, bucko. She then hears her name being called again from behind her, and as she turns away, Cal disappears. The voice that is calling her continues. You can come out now, the big creepy crawly is all gone. Parker heads over to the window and she sees Ice Cream Man, aka the town's hero in the sky, aka Rick Sweet. Ice Cream Man tells Parker, there she is, Urbanopolis's reporter laureate. Parker, unamused, replies, Can I help you? Ice Cream Man continues, Please, join me at my isolation palace in the Arctic Circle. Dinner and an exclusive interview? The scoop of the century. Parker, now having had a closer look at Ice Cream Man, is suspecting that he is actually her co-worker Rick Sweet. She's a little taken aback by his offer to have dinner with him and interview this Ice Cream Man hero. She cannot stand this guy who keeps making unnecessary headlines, and now more so since she already dislikes her co-worker Rick Sweet. But this is also the guy that is bringing the paper money with all of his heroic acts. For the sake of her career and her boss's orders, Parker Page reluctantly agrees to this invitation. Later that evening, Parker, having accepted this invitation, arrives at the Ice Cream Man's Isolation Palace 
in the Arctic Circle. This is very similar to Superman's Fortress of Solitude. As the Ice Cream Man is showing her around, we see various trophies and memorabilia from past Ice Cream Man issues that are kept on display in this isolation palace. We see a fur coat of Caleb's wolf dog that Rick hunted from way back in issue 9. We see Bud Hickey's electric guitar from when he met a bunch of musicians in an ice cream psychedelic rainbow dream world back in issue 3. We see the mysterious cursed coat taken at a coat check and mistakenly worn by Lillian back in issue 15. There is also an arrow emblem from issue 13, Palindromes. That was the issue that went frontwards to backwards and back again. There is the buzzard from Ice Cream Man issue 5. We also see Stephanie is still carrying a rose from the Bachelorette parody TV show called Mannequin House, which we saw back in issue 11. The series continues to sprout several Easter eggs throughout each issue with reoccurring themes and identifying objects that represent the Ice Cream Man and all of his well-curated work over time. The Ice Cream Man escorts Parker through his palace while giving her a tour. In his palace, he has several robotic servants which attend to him. He turns to one of his servants, called Bob-13, and hands him Parker's luggage, and tells the robot to take her to her suite. The Ice Cream Man continues telling Parker that he wants to tell her his story, and for her to get to know the real him. Parker replies, No offense, but there are more important things to report on than superheroes. Ice Cream Man responds, And yet, here you are, that's gotta mean something, right? Come, let me show you some amazing stuff. He takes Parker into a new room, and as they walk over a bridge, he introduces her to the Drippers. He explains, These are Drippers, liquid sentries from a musical basement dimension. They feed on melody and the protein of pure song. We first saw these Drippers back in issue 3, when we saw Bud Hickey's adventure in his quest to make a new hit song. The Ice Cream Man holds up an old-fashioned gramophone speaker for the Drippers. It is playing Bud Hickey's one-hit wonder classic called Rock All the Time. Parker looking down at the Drippers reveals, They're disgusting. The Ice Cream Man corrects her, saying, Everything's disgusting once you start to pay attention. There are microscopic insects crawling all over your skin. Careful, or they might just eat you alive. They continue their tour. The Ice Cream Man explains, The Isolation Palace is a multimodal. It's a library, a preserve, my sanctum, and the bird was born of man, birthed through a sternum into a three-colored world. The bird that the Ice Cream Man is holding is the same one we saw being born in a nameless man's chest who walked down three separate versions of his life in Strange Neapolitan back in issue 6. The Ice Cream Man then shows Parker his hospital room, and we again see the surgeon dogs that were operating on Will Parson back in issue 11. The surgeon dogs are in the middle of performing a lobotomy. The Ice Cream Man adds, We can cure ahead of nasty thoughts. Parker is really alarmed at everything she has seen up to this point. They continue along, and the Ice Cream Man then introduces Parker to his figgly bumps. He explains to her, I keep here the last few extant specimens of a rare species, Cutis minimus, more commonly known as figgly bumps. Figgly bump DNA is coded for culinary sacrifice. They serve no other purpose than to be delicious. A docile species, essentially wordless. They want us to eat them so that we can enjoy their gamey meat. The Ice Cream Man then asks Parker to dine with him tonight. Let us honor the Figgly Bumps' wishes and sup on their tiny, adorable bodies. Parker retires to her suite before dinner that evening. She reports her findings so far with what is happening. She narrates, Dairy monsters feeding on old pop lyrics? Unnerving oddity after unnerving oddity? This isn't the lonely fortress of a superhero. This is something else. The scoop of the century? Who is Ice Cream Man? What is he? 
I need answers to tough questions. Now, tomorrow's just too late. Parker leaves her room and she stealthily makes her way around the compound, trying to find some answers on her own. She comes across the strange bird man who is in Strange Neapolitan back in issue six. But then the robot Bob 13 appears and stops her in her tracks. He tells her, Miss Page, dinner is served in the main hall. Master is waiting patiently. Parker is led to join Ice Cream Man for dinner that night. He tells her that his many travels across the Maniverse have opened his eyes to the truth. And with this, he would like to recite a poem to her, a haiku. Every little thing is fragmented, atomized like a bunch of bugs. And with that beautiful haiku, he then wishes her bon appetit. The ice cream man then reveals Parker's dinner plate, and on it is a live figly bump that is staring straight at her. The figly bump starts crying, and it tells Parker, We're not food. The smiling man, he's drugging us. The figly bumps are being slaughtered. It's genocide, I tell ya. The ice cream man seeing this is annoyed. He tells his servant to take the dish away and to bring Miss Page a new one that is properly prepared. The robot, Bob 13, apologizes and says that her meat is undercooked and he'll be right back with a new plate. The figly bump continues pleading for its life. Parker, completely terrified at this, runs off. Her narration continues. This place, it's a house of horrors. It's a trap. She's running and she's thinking to herself, in what are likely the final seconds of my life, I'd like to reiterate the idea of Ice Cream Man is a bad one. Salvation isn't one person's job. It's on all of us. She then yells out, Everything is one thing! The Ice Cream Man following her responds and says, Not really. I was hoping to convince you to procreate with me tonight. To bring into wretched existence a whole race of deformed superhuman horrors. Shame. Parker, disgusted and enraged all the same, is now scared for her life just as the figly bumps were. Captured, she tells the ice cream man, one day the world's gonna wake up and see what you really are, a lie. The ice cream man, refusing to take any blame for what Parker is accusing him of, explains to her, the world is predicated on lies, pulled apart by them. Every little thing is fragmented, atomized like a bunch of bugs. He then orders his servants, Bobots, please treat our peerless reporter to a therapeutic bath in the deep fryer. Elsewhere, we then suddenly see that Parker Page is in a hospital room. By her bedside is her boss, the editor-in-chief, and her fellow reporter, Timmy. Parker wakes up, screaming. Her colleagues welcome her back now that she's awake. She asks them, what happened? My head. Her boss tells her what happened. What happened is my star reporter was in a coma for three years. Sales are in the toilet. Parker is now really confused and very cognizant of what she knows she just experienced. She asks, three years, but, but that, wait, where's the ice cream man? Her boss does not seem to know the name ice cream man as the superhero of their city. He just thinks that she really wants some ice cream. He replies, You hear that, Timmy? Get her some of that lemon sorbet in a cup, will ya? Timmy replies, In a jiffy, Miss Page, lickety split. The editor-in-chief continues, Ice cream man, <laughs> Parker Page's sweet tooth alive and well. It's good to have you back, Page. This world could use a hero right about now. The issue then abruptly cuts away to squeeze in a quick Batman parody in an epilogue. We see a little Bruce Wayne-like kid has just left the movie theater. Instead of seeing Zorro, which is typical in Batman's origin, the little kid has instead left a movie with his parents called The Masked Whatever. Then someone is about to mug the boy and his parents in an alley, but the mugger is then beat up by a different version of Ice Cream Man in white dressed like a devil version of Batman. The little boy's parents ask the white deviled hero, My God, you saved us. What's your name, noble stranger? The masked hero answers, I'm... But then the book cuts off before we learn this hero's name. 
and the final page reads, A bad idea? Or just the thing that jolts this story alive? Find out never in the pages of Confective Comics number 1. Issue 18. Watch as it all recedes. We are introduced to an old man lying in a hospital bed. The old man is named George. George is slowly dying and slipping in and out of consciousness as he is creeping towards the end of his life. Right now, all he has left are some fond memories of his life, but even these are tainted and are beginning to fade more and more as he recalls them. He silently narrates us through his final thoughts and final moments. The gremlin, he's at it again. He's stealing my memories. They're gone, gone, and some are gone. George's nurse then enters his hospital room. She wishes him a good morning and gives him his medication. She tells him that she's got good news, that his son called and will be visiting him today. George, hearing about his son, is reminded of a time when he himself was a young boy. We see a flashback where George, his parents, and a young girl that is some relative to him is setting up a picnic in the park, but his connection to the girl seems to be lost to George as he's trying to remember her relationship to him, but his memory is fading. George's narration continues, but his words are not always coherent and are often skewed as he is slowly losing his ability to properly recall memories. I am, was, three, or though, maybe two years old? Mom, dad, lay out blank, 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 blanket. Mom, dad, lay out blanket, and, and who is she? My sister, my cousin, maybe my friend? Anne, who is blank, reads book under tree and everyone is happy. But wait, there he is now. He's come to take this memory away from me. The little gremlin, he's taking it. It's, it's gone. We see that George was referring to a little gremlin that has entered George's mind and his earliest memory. And this gremlin has now started to take fragments of George's memory away. Not only did George not recall the relationship of this young girl to him, but the girl's complete existence has just been wiped away from his mind. This was likely George's sister, and she is sadly gone forever from this fond echo of time. Back in George's hospital room, his son has now arrived. His son's name is John, and John asks his father how he's holding up. George is unresponsive to speak at this point, so instead his son John confides in his dad. He shares that he's sorry it took him so long to come and visit. He also shares that he's having marriage difficulties with his wife. His son also says that he just heard from his sister and she will also be visiting their father here soon. John asks his father to blink if he's comfortable. George, he does not do so. Instead, George enters yet another fading memory in his mind with the little gremlin close by. We see another flashback with George's continued narration in his mind from Memory Lane. Later memory, I'm 10 years old. I see it so clear, a baseball diamond. George's thoughts are confused. His words are not exactly correct. George is a young boy in this memory playing baseball. He wants to hit a home run. His narration continues. Diamond, baseball diamond, peewee league with me, I'm up to bat. Bobby K pitched to me. I want to hit the ball. I, I want to hit a home run. Deepest feeling of deep in gut, but don't think, I don't think that I ever did do that. George struck out at bat. He did not get a hit. The gremlin is walking around the baseball diamond, slowly erasing everyone. Erasing Bobby K, the pitcher, and then the umpire, and then before you know it, everyone in this memory is gone. Everyone but... George himself, standing there as a young boy, alone. Back in the hospital room, George's daughter named Midge has arrived for a visit. She says hello to her dad and sees that he is not looking so great. She brings him some good news, telling him that she has decided to get pregnant and to become a single mother, and she's about six weeks away from delivery. 
George, not realizing his daughter's good news or even hearing or seeing her there, instead sees another group of visitors instead. We see the Green Gremlin, but he is also accompanied by the Balloon Boy from way back in the coat check issue with Lillian, and a dripper appears here again, and the dog in a straight jacket, also from a previous issue. All of these are accomplices of the Ice Cream Man and friends of the Gremlin, of course. George's silent narration continues. Night at night, he brings him his friends. They are not very nice. I do not like them one bit. George then recalls another memory, one that begins to fade away some more of his mental images. In this flashback, we see that George is with his ex-wife, Kara. They are at the beginning of their relationship together. They have just begun dating. They are walking on the beach and eating an ice cream cone together and holding hands. Such tender moments were these. George's thoughts continue. A very nice memory, nicest? Kara and myself, young, young love, young lovers of each other and one another. We walk like we glide across it, the beach, the sand, and the water. We call smell of her lovely, and as she playfully ran from me, I run too after her. No words can do, cannot describe how happy I was. But then Kara begins to slowly get erased from one of George's nicest memories. He begs, pleads silently with the gremlin, no, please, don't, not this one, please. It's my favorite one. It is taken. All is being taken, has been took. George sobbing. He is now left all alone again in what was once such a treasured memory of his. George then goes on to recall a sooner memory where he and Kara have been married a long time now. Their kids, John and Midge, are just about the age of teenagers, and George has a serious drinking problem by now. His silent thoughts continue. I was unable, did not love like one should, was cold when I should have been different, did not, could not love like I should have loved. Why was I so mean, cold, when all I wanted was to be happy, have never been, was never again happy. She ran from me. Since this was not a happy memory for George, we notice now that the gremlin is absent from this, as he saw there is nothing here that needed to be erased. The erasing at this time was of George's own doing, forcing his wife and kids to leave based on his behavior. In this memory, the gremlin did nothing as he ensured this sad memory would be kept intact for George to never forget. In the present day, George's son John continues confiding in his father about his own failing marriage with his wife back home. He says that his wife is leaving him and that she's planning on taking the kids. And he tells his father that he guesses that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He is referring to his father's own failing marriage with his own mother. While all of this is happening, the gremlin is close by. Midge, George's daughter, carries on with her father about how difficult it is for her to be standing on her feet while pregnant. She then contemplates if maybe she has made a mistake wanting a child. She tells her father, I was so certain, but now I'm just scared. I don't want to screw it up like you and mom did. No offense, daddy. We then see in another flashback a memory of George's when his family drove on a vacation to the Grand Canyon. This was another good memory of his, from when his kids were much younger and years before his wife Kara had left him. George's silent thoughts continue as he recalls their family trip together. We're going to the Grand Canyon, I know that. We're going there in this memory. I can recall, like, very close, heat of air, heat of bodies that are my family, but do not recall, as I am seeing now, him, the little gremlin. I do not like seeing him. And we see that this little gremlin has yet again made another appearance in George's memory in order to tarnish any fond recollection that George might still have of his past. Everything does get taken in the end. Everything goes goodbye. Kara went goodbye. 
married Tim, or maybe Dan, or Jason, and then got sick with and died of blank, escaping me. She ran from me and was gone. I wish I could have been different. My children have become complicated people, but also are, will always be so beautiful to me. How beautiful both my children. As George slips in and out of his final robbed memory and back into the present day, his children are at his bedside and comforting him during his final moments. His son, crying, tells his father that it's okay for him to let go now. And as the little gremlin continues his final acts on George, George's finishing thoughts conclude. Do wish very deeply that they can know, can find a way to be happy. Oh, just realized I not, no longer can recall who I am or was, but do feel very certainly that, indeed, I was a person who lived a life and perhaps once felt the sweet light breath of the sun. How lucky, me, to have been. And at the hands of the little gremlin, and ultimately the ice cream man, that concludes this issue, along with George's memories and his life. Issue 19, Haunting for Beginners. This complete issue is in black and white and is narrated by someone named Casper. It is broken up into three parts. Casper's life unfolds from a boy at the age of nine to a man at the age of 39 and then as an old man at the age of 78. On the cover of this issue, Haunting for Beginners, we see the tools that are supposedly needed to make a successful ghost costume. These include, number one, one pair of kitchen scissors, two, one clean white bedsheet, three, a sense of your own insignificance, and four, the propensity to quietly wander. There are also simple instructions with steps one through three on how to be a true blue apparition, which is otherwise known as being a ghost. These include, step one, don your suit, two, roam invisibly, three, observe the living. This information is relevant as we will soon learn more about its purpose. We see an opening page that is a list full of objects and their respective title. These objects will be seen throughout the first part of this story. So we see a little boy named Casper at age nine. He is a ghost that is dead, presumably. He is dressed up in a bedsheet. Also, there is a silky soft Angora rabbit that is alive, and a fox that is also alive. There is also an ice cream treat of Rick Sweets that in some way or another shall make an appearance in this story. We meet our main character, Casper. He is nine years old. He's sitting on his bedroom floor, covered in a bedsheet and dressed up as a ghost. In a moment, his mom will call him downstairs to watch their favorite reality TV program together. She is eating Rick's ice cream. Now, we saw on the cover page that Casper has already covered steps one through three of the simple instructions on how to be a true blue apparition. Here, we will continue with his narration on each page with all the additional steps it takes to truly be this true blue apparition. Here are the steps. Step four, hear their voices from downstairs. Five, hear the television set announce its programming. Note the ambient volume loud enough to be heard from space. Six, see your parents in repose. Question your shared DNA. Dream of various emancipation scenarios. Seven, glide down the stairs. You are a ghost. Eight, glide across the room. You are a ghost. Nine, pass through the door. Completely unsubstantial. 10. See your town at sunset. Note the way the day recedes, how it gives birth to a liberating blanket of darkness. 11. Approach the Trebelli home under cover of new night. 12. Look through the window. Mr. and Mrs. Trebelli argue about Mr. Trebelli's failed business venture. You are a ghost. 13. Note as you make your way to the back of the house that pretty much every Mr. and Mrs. in town are caught up in some kind of years-long argument about something. 14. 
Wonder if marriage is ever really worth it. Wonder if your Uncle Pete, whom your mom calls the Perpetual Bachelor, might even have the right idea by avoiding relationships and love altogether. 15. Enter Jimmy Trebelli's bedroom and give him a scare. You are a ghost. We then meet Casper's best friend named Jimmy Trebelli. Jimmy is sitting on his bedroom floor, surrounded by a bunch of Angora bunny rabbits. His father had recently purchased a few, and they are very quickly reproducing. Casper makes a quick appearance, visiting his friend Jimmy, and then he continues his narration steps. Step 16. See that Jimmy is surrounded by a bunch of rabbits. 17. Invite this living human to join you in the spirit realm, as an apparitional sidekick of some kind. Casper does this by asking his friend, You want to be a ghost with me? 18. Hear of the curse cast upon poor Jimmy by forces beyond all reckoning. Feel sorrow at his apparent misfortune. Jimmy answered, I'm grounded. Hey, you need a rabbit? 19. Politely decline this earthly offer of his aid, and do not accept a pet rabbit. You are a ghost, and ghosts have no need for anything that is fuzzy and adorable. As Casper leaves Jimmy's home, he continues his journey throughout the night. He continues to narrate steps outlining his adventures. 22. Float through your town, past the convenience stores, past the shuttered video rental place, past the spot where that one high school kid crashed a car into a bus. 23. Cross the train tracks, despite explicit instructions from your mother to never ever do so. 24. Notice that there is a dead fox by the tracks. 25. As you look at the dead fox, disregard that sick feeling in your stomach. You are a ghost, untethered from any sentimental mortal human stuff. 26. Make your way to that spot, under the pedestrian bridge that you've always liked. The one at the edge of the long tunnel, where the feral cats hunt for food scraps. 27. Haunt at your discretion. As Casper is under this pedestrian bridge, he looks up and he notices a man preparing to jump to his death. Step 31. Look up at the pedestrian bridge. See the man aloft. See him on the ledge in a leaning posture that looks kind of weird. Step 32. Wonder what it is he's doing up there atop this tunnel and the feral cats that you like so much. Step 33. See the man's shoes lift off. Try to identify what is the look on his face, fear or relief. Step 34. Try in vain to call out to him. 35. Watch the man's body yield to gravity and see him begin to fall. 36. Remember, he cannot hear you. You are a ghost. 37. Watch him fall. Feel the little hairs on your shoulder stand up as if electrified. 38. Watch and understand that there isn't a single thing you can do. You are a ghost. A non-entity. 39. Hear the thud of his body hitting concrete. Observe what is this new gurgling sound as the blood escapes his body. 40. From the spirit plane that you exist in, call out to the lifeless figure before you. 41. Hear his response, but it is silent. 42. Deny the truth. Refuse vehemently to accept what has just happened before your very eyes. 43. Plead with the land of the living. 44. And understand that no one can ever hear you. 45. Know that you are a ghost. 46. Try and fail to understand what you have just witnessed. 47. Try and fail to erase the sound of the gurgle from your ears. 48. Having regained your physical self only temporarily, find comfort in the soft purr of a kitten. 49. Wonder why a person would, as your dad puts it, off themselves. Step 50. Wonder it for 30 years. We now jump to part two of this story. 30 years have passed and Casper is now 39 years old. And we see that he still considers himself a ghost that is dead. We also see an autumn leaf and also a symbol of a sitting cross-legged body pointing out where each chakra point is located. Step one, mope at your desk in your cubicle. Mope under the fluorescent lighting of your office. Step two, mope at the coffee machine. Mope as one report becomes 10 reports and 10 becomes a hundred. Three, mope at the water cooler. Mope as your coworker tells you 
all about his new business idea. Step four, look at the way certain details of your sorry sad sack life tend to reflect the same way as light through a prism does. Step five, mope through the parking lot against the autumn wind all the way to your compact automobile. Six, understand that you are a ghost, completely unsubstantial. Mope about it the entire car ride home. Seven, stop at the supermarket for groceries on your way home. Eight, pick up your favorite dessert that is Rick's Sweet Ice Cream. Read the ingredients on the back, which are very strange things you have never heard of before. Wonder if they aren't perhaps things that people should be consuming. Nine, mope yourself all the way to the crowded checkout lanes. Ten, as the checkout girl ignores you, remember ghosts are not seen. They go completely undetected by the human eye. Eleven, from deep in the ether, zap a spooky missive in her direction. 12. Though she will never see you, remind this living, breathing specimen of your relative proximity to her. Step 13. Sit in traffic as you head home. Scan the radio stations and avoid at all costs the following. 14. Elevator Muzak. Anything house or techno adjacent. Gregorian chanting. That old Bud Hickey song which perpetually true to its name, continues to endlessly rock all the time. Step 15. Hear a familiar voice that is emanating from your car radio. 16. Recognize that it is your own voice. Hear yourself at age 9, pleading with the man on the bridge. Step 17. Remember the thud of the man's body hitting the ground. Remember the gurgle. Step 18. Try to forget, but always remember. As Casper finally arrives home. We will see him conversing with his wife as his children are watching Stephanie on the reality TV show Mannequin House nearby. Casper's narration steps continue. Step 19. As you arrive home, brace yourself for another interaction with your wife and kids. Perform a 30-second meditation as you enter the house. 20. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through your mouth. Speak your mantra. 21. Phase through the door. Float across the threshold and into your home. 22. See your wife and note how beautiful she remains, year after year after year. Step 23. Give the same answer you always give when she asks how your day was. It was fine. Step 24. Feel disconnected from the people you love most. Feel stuck. Feel lost. Step 25. See your wife apply lipstick. Wonder, where is she gone? Step 26. Remember that even in your own house, you are a ghost. 27. Do the math in your head. Ask yourself, why does your wife need to go and see her massage therapist while wearing lipstick again? Step 28. Listen to your living wife tell you a bunch of nonsense and consider the significance of what it means for him to align her chakras. Step 29. Feel her pass through you and make her way to the door. Your wife tells you to clean the gutters while she leaves. Step 30. Don't forget to clean the gutters. Step 31. Enter the garage to retrieve a ladder to clean the gutters. Step 32. Search around for the string that dangles somewhere around the ceiling light bulb and pull on it to produce light. 33. Wonder, why is it that you never actually park your car in here? Say a silent prayer for every empty garage across the world that is unused in vain. 34. See the dusty box of childhood mementos on the floor. 35. See yourself as you are all those years ago. 36. Wonder about whatever happened to your best friend, Jimmy Trebelli, that boy with all the suffocating rabbits. Lament the way all relationships end and how people disappear. 37. Take the ladder outside and prepare for your ascent up atop the roof. 38. Float upwards. You are lighter than air. 39. Float up, up, up all the way to the very tippy top. 40. Clean out the gutters and remember that you are a ghost. 41. Look around. Feel sorry for the leaves, how they are separated from their branches. Feel sorry for everyone, how they are separated from each other. 42. See it. 43. Really see your town. Step 44. Remember from up here the man on the bridge. I wonder if he saw what you see now. 45. A world full of ghosts. 46. Wonder if the man pre-thud, pre-gurgle was scared or relieved. 47. Feel as he probably felt. A gentle pushback of air as you extend a limb into the void. 48. 
Feel it. 49. As you contemplate what you are feeling, think about your kids. Think about your wife. 50. Do the math in your head. 51. Mope down the ladder. 52. Mope while you put the ladder back into your carless garage. Then mope back into your house. 53. Mope for the rest of your life. Casper was traumatized as a boy by watching this man jump off this bridge. And now that he is a middle-aged man at 39, he lives a kind of empty existence with kids that are bored by him and a wife that is most likely cheating on him. He continues to live his life, but he is almost a ghost in his own life. Hence the mantra, you are a ghost. We now jump ahead to the third part of this issue. Casper is now 78 years old and is an elderly man. He has also gained several more health-related matters at this point. Casper at 78 begins with a new first step of how to be a true blue apparition at this new stage of his life. Step 1. Get cancer of some kind. 2. Hear the doctor do the math on your mortality. 3. Do the math of your mortality in your head. 4. Mope back to your car. Get ready for the end. 5. See a scared animal in the Oncology Center parking lot. Consider that it might look familiar to you. 6. Pick it up and note how soft it is. Imagine a sweater this soft. Recall that this looks like an Angora rabbit, the kind that your childhood best friend Jimmy Trebelli had. Whatever happened to him? 7. Pass quietly in the comfort of your home, as the Angora bunny stands by for comfort. Step 8. Be dead. 9. Float. Suddenly out of your physical body and into the air above the bed. 10. From four feet above, look down at yourself. Step 11. Attempt from the afterlife to communicate with your youngest daughter. 12. Understand that you are a ghost and she cannot hear you. 13. Rise up through the ceiling. 14. Emerge from your roof completely insubstantial. 15. Fly into the crisp air of late October. 16. See higher than ever before, the humble expanse of your own town. 17. From this spectral vantage, hear the multivalent noise of the living. Conversations in kitchen nooks, arguments about wall paint, thuds and gurgles, and kittens purrs, too. Also hear radio static. Step 18. Travel through the air. 19. See how small it all gets from on high. See the things of this world shrink until they are nothing but faraway ideas. See them gain significance in the shrinking. 20. Wonder, is this what the falling man saw? Wonder, was it relief on his face after all? 21. Wonder no more. See that he is next to you in the sky. 22. Speaking in a language made of light, join hands with the falling man. 23. Fly together over your town, over every town. 24. Float through the air above what is a categorically substantial world. 25. See the story of Casper with all of its sweet and bitter alterations over time. See your wife and her massage therapist married, living a long life together, always seeking peace. Step 27. Your oldest daughter, a veterinarian, saving the lives of countless lesser creatures. 28. No, correct yourself, not lesser. Nothing is lesser understand from up here 29 all things are one thing 30 note the significance of every single story step 31 that every story is a ghost story 32 climb higher ascend forever 33 and then when you think you are as high as you can go 34 climb some more you are a ghost 35 but you are seen and with this we end issue 19, when Casper actually became a real ghost. Issue 20 for Kids In this issue, Ice Cream Man is going to read us three classic children's stories, which many of us may recall from our own childhood. Except all of these stories will be very twisted and weird and creepy. Ice Cream Man is in the kitchen of a home, 
preparing some food. He is chopping some carrots, and we see that he is adding some of his own special ingredient into the mix, blood. He yells out to the children in the house that it's time for bed. Two children are tucked in bed. They call out to the ice cream man and refer to him as their dad. They say, but dad, you promised us a story. Stories, multiple. The ice cream man, while finishing his final bits of chopping and mixing the food, responds to them from the kitchen. Well, all right, a couple yarns then, but after that, it's lights out, understand? I want the both of you asleep in a jiffy. The ice cream man joins the two children in their bedroom. He sits at the foot of their bed and opens up a book called Good Night, You. This book is a twisted parody of the story Good Night, Moon by Margaret Wise Brown. The ice cream man begins reciting the story. In the small padded room, there was a tissue box and a boy with a balloon, and a picture of a girl heating up a spoon. And there were three cruddy bears sitting on chairs, and two chopped up rabbits and a red stained hatchet, and a little toy house, and a giant louse, and a bottle and a boat and a suicide note, and a sick old lady whispering, it's the one that I wrote. Good night, room. Good night, boy with a balloon. Good night, girl who's heating a spoon. Good night, louse and good night, house. Good night to the rabbits, chopped up with the hatchet, and the tissue box which speaks, and the bears in their seats. Good night, bottle. Good night, boat. Good night to the lady and her suicide note. But she was mistaken, that note I wrote. Good night, nobody. Good night, air. Good night to all the things that are not really there. The two kids, having heard this weird story, ask, She was crazy, wasn't she? The girl in the story. I knew it. The boy adds, Hey, Dad. Why do people go nuts? The ice cream man responds, It's because their brains are mushy and full of holes, and the holes are where the crawly things wiggle their way inside. People are so susceptible to bad ideas. Then enters the children's mother. Her name is Jane. Jane says to the kids, Did somebody say nighttime carrots? Or did the caterpillars get into my head again? Jane holds up a tray of the specially prepared carrots by the ice cream man that he was making earlier with his blood. And she says, Carrots! Carrots for my kids! Something is up with Jane. She has a really fake plastered smile on her face. And she's also crying too. As the kids eat their delicious carrots, the ice cream man thanks Jane and asks her to go. and get them some glasses of milk to drink, while he begins to read them yet another book that he promised. The ice cream man then holds up the next book, called The Loving Tree, which many of us may recognize as the original storybook that is called The Giving Tree. The little girl in the room says, that one's kind of sad, daddy. The boy adds, triple sad. Ice cream man replies, everything's sad, all the time, every day. Ice Cream Man begins telling the story of the loving tree. On the first page, there is a picture of a boy looking up at a big, tall tree. Once upon a time, there was a tree who loved a boy, and the tree watched as the boy grew up. We see that the boy in the story is a bit older here, and then the boy grows even older and taller now, and the story goes on. But the boy was, shall we say, troubled. He loved to do things that he knew he shouldn't do. The boy smoked cigarettes. The boy hurt other boys. The boy experimented with drugs. The boy crashed his foster mother's car. The boy, for no real reason at all, lit things on fire. The tree watched all of this and loved the boy regardless. Until one day, the boy poured kerosene onto the tree. Then he lit a match to its bark. And the tree asked, Why are you doing this to me? I have loved you your entire life. I even looked the other way when... As a boy, you reached your hand under a girl's shirt without asking first. The boy responded, I've got a hole in me I can never fill. I do bad stuff all the time because I'm a broken person. And I'll probably die before I turn 50, that's my guess. And then the tree burned down to nothing. And since that tree was on a piece of land outside the jurisdiction of certain preservation laws, a developer paved the forest and sold the plot to one of those overbright big box stores. And we see that the boy is now a man, and he is standing next to where the tree had stood. In place of it is a store called Rick's Goods. 
Ice Cream Man reading the final page of the book to the kids continues. And then the boy was right. He died in his 40s in some kind of accident on the factory floor where he worked. The specifics don't really matter. The hole in the boy was never filled. The tree was long gone. And many more trees would soon follow. Listen close and you can hear another one being chopped down, screaming, But I loved you! I loved you! The story of The Loving Tree is finished. And again, the story was not at all like the original version The Giving Tree. These poor children are being exposed to some pretty horrible bedtime stories at the hands of the Ice Cream Man. The Ice Cream Man stands up for a break and he says to the kids, See, that wasn't so bad. The world needs more stories. Now you two sit tight while I go check on your mom real quick. When I get back, we've got one more story to tell. As the Ice Cream Man heads downstairs, we see a man in the background. That man is named Gary. Gary is hunched down in a recliner, bleeding, seemingly dead. Gary is the actual father of the children and husband of Jane. Ice Cream Man says aloud, Evening, Gary. Ice Cream Man enters the kitchen to check in on Jane. Jane is pouring a couple of glasses of milk for the kids, but the milk is overflowing from the glass. Ice Cream Man says to her, Knock, knock. How's the milk coming, honey bear? Say, you are making an awful mess. To this, Jane agrees and says, ba Bad mess. Ice Cream Man, seeing the struggle, comforts her, telling her, Relax, Jane. It's just some spilled milk. You're not supposed to cry over it. Jane is clearly not doing well, almost in a trance of terror from the Ice Cream Man terrorizing her and her family. While the Ice Cream Man is downstairs in the kitchen with Jane, back in the bedroom, the girl stands up to get a new book. She tells her brother, You know he's not our real dad, referring to the Ice Cream Man. Our dad is named Gary, referring to the man Gary that we saw downstairs, perhaps dead on the recliner. The brother responds, My head gets all fuzzy when... That man enters the room. The boy is referring to the ice cream man and his ability to mess with people's minds and confuse them. The girl then pulls a different book from the shelf. The book is called Weed Laced with Coke, and it is written by an author by the name of Dr. Sweet. This book is a parody of Green Eggs and Ham, written by Dr. Seuss. The girl says to her brother, These stories, they're all wrong. She then reads the title out loud. Weed laced with Coke. Do you think the book means Coke as in soda? No, the book does not mean that, little girl. <laughs> the boy, getting a bit scared now, pleads with his sister. Please don't read it, sis. Please don't. The girl, though, seeming somewhat hypnotized, starts reading the story to her brother. They did eat some funky carrots, after all. That may be contributing to their haze. The story begins. That Gremaloak, that Gremaloak, I do not like that Gremaloak. Would you smoke weed laced with coke? We see in the story a man is being visited by a little green gremlin, a storybook version of the one we saw earlier that was tormenting George in the hospital bed during his final moments back in issue 18. The little gremlin, known as a Gremaloak, here is asking the man all of the questions in this story while the man is the one giving him the answers. I would not smoke weed laced with coke. Would you smoke it up or down? I would not smoke it up or down. I would not smoke it then or now. I do not want weed laced with coke. I do not want it, Gremaloak. Would you smoke it in the Hague? Would you smoke it during a plague? I would not smoke it in the Hague. I would not smoke it during a plague. I would not smoke it up or down. I would not smoke it then or now. I do not want weed laced with coke. I do not want it, Gremaloak. Would you smoke it in a cog? Would you smoke it with Mad Dog? Not in a cog. Not with Mad Dog. Not in the Hague. Not during the plague. I will not smoke it up or down. I will not smoke it then or now. I will not smoke weed laced with coke. I do not want it, Gremaloak. Would you, could you, on the hood? Smoke it. Do it. You'll feel good. I will not, would not, on the hood. You might like it. Take a puff. You might enjoy it. Off a bluff. I would not, could not, off a bluff. Not on the hood, it's dangerous stuff. You will not smoke this little joint? I do not want to, that's the point. Maybe with a figgly bump? Would you, could you, as we jump? 
repeating everything once again. I could not, shall not, as we jump, and no way with a figly bump. I will not smoke it in the hag, and I ain't inhaling while there is a plague. Not in a cog, not with mad dog, not on the hood. You're near do good. I will not smoke it up or down. I will not smoke it then or now. I will not smoke it while we drown. You don't wanna, so you say. Just try it, man, and you may. Smoke it, and you may, I say. Gremlin, if you will let me be, I'll smoke the thing. You will see. The character then smokes the weed laced with coke. Wow, I like weed laced with coke. I do, I like it, Gremoloke. As the children are finishing the story, the ice cream man enters the room. He tells the kids, you know, the man in the story, he smoked it the rest of his life. Angrily then, the ice cream man tells the kids, you guys read without me. The kids' teeth chattering now say, sorry daddy, daddy dearest, dearest daddy. The ice cream man opens his arms wide and tells the kids, oh that's alright. Who can stay mad at two adorable little skeletons covered in meat? As he is hugging them, he adds, and I bet it slides right off the bone. Hey, how about one more story for the road? This one's called Little Jane. We then see that this story is actually about the children's mother, Jane. The one who was just downstairs crying over spilt milk and making a mess of things. Ice Cream Man's story goes... Little Jane was very plain and lived a life of plenty. She married Gary, who now looks scary, back when they were 20. But life, you know, is long and strange and full of small frustrations. The world gets warped, mixed up, deranged, despite your lamentations. Now Little Jane, she took great pains to flee her charming captor. She waved at all the small town cars, but whoosh, they whizzed right past her. And then poor Jane, damn near insane, head hot and heart aflutter approached a cow, a burger now, and asked, are you my mother? And that, my friends, is where it ends. The screws were put upon her, as she canonized her favorite guys, St. Manson, Gacy, Donner. So little Jane, her arms restrained, was hauled off in the wagon. Her brain was mush and full of holes, but who knows why that happens. As the ice cream man finishes the story, he tucks the children into bed. He then tells them, Nighty night, don't let the bed bugs bite. And with this, we end Volume 5 of Ice Cream Man. Alright, so that was Ice Cream Man Volume 5. Let me go through my thoughts on the various issues in this volume. So, Issue 17, the Superman-esque story, I thought was pretty good, pretty entertaining, creepy as hell. Ice Cream Man as Superman, dating Lois Lane, bringing her to his Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic there, and seeing all the creepy shit he had in there was honestly very intriguing, and I really dug that issue. Issue 18, watch as it all recedes, was depressing as hell. <laughs> this old man dying in his hospital bed, reliving some memories, and the memories are being taken from him by this weird gremlin dude. It was sad as hell, but you know... It was disturbing, it was creepy, it was effective, I think. So, you know what, I kind of liked it, although, you know, depressing, as I said. <laughs> issue 19, Haunting for Beginners, was a very avant-garde issue, telling this story almost like a instruction manual, in a way, with various steps, but the steps are just narrating what is happening, and this character is a ghost. But uh, there is something to that story, how... We see him as a ghost as a kid in this costume, but then as a middle-aged man, he is also a ghost. He is kind of forgotten in his life. No one cares about him. And then he's an old man, and he becomes finally a literal ghost. So uh, I think there was some interesting stuff in this story. It was told in a unique way and kind of went to some interesting places. Is it my favorite story ever? No, but there's some interesting stuff there. Issue 20. The For Kids one, where Ice Cream Man is telling these kids some bedtime stories, and they're all creepy, weird twists on actual children's bedtime stories. And uh, yeah, I think some of these were kind of interesting, seeing these perverted versions of these stories. Uh, I particularly liked the uh, Dr. Seuss parody. Instead of green eggs and ham, it is weed laced with coke. I do not want weed laced with coke. I do not want it, Gremel Oak. <laughs> So weird and twisted and creepy, man. But yeah, kind of fun. 
Overall, I think this volume was intriguing. I maybe didn't love any of the stories that much, but they're all kind of cool in their own way. I'm going to give this volume a 7.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. Let me know your thoughts on these Twisted Ice Cream Man tales, and I will see you all again in the future.